the reason that, that our resident and I pick this topic on grantsmanship is because we all apply for grants as part of um, so-called my leadership role for PSF for the last many years is to rejuvenate and maybe even push our envelope in our research enterprise so that not only can our residents and our faculty be competitive at the PSF level, but leveraging that to compete for federal grant funding in NIH as well as in the VA system. Uh, ultimately, I think that we're doing very well. I think that the grants nowadays are much, much more competitive, but even then we still have a long way to go. And I think that every single resident in our program are expected and have applied and have gotten PSF funding, and many of them are competing for federal grant funding. So I think that this is a, a good synthesis for me to, um, to share with you my thoughts about how to apply for grants, because just because you know how to write a paper, writing a grant is very different in writing a paper. So let me share with you. Um, you know, this is, if you look at a topic on grantsmanship, typically people just go, God, it's going to be another miserable hour and a half. So I was telling my chief resident, Katie, and my fellow, Erica, that I'm experimenting. I've never given this talk before. Experimenting on how a middle-aged or older person can be hip. <laughs> so whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. In fact, my wife walked by and saw my slides and kind of go, oh my god. <laughs> who, who are you presenting this to? I said, to the whole country. And she, she was not happy because she thought it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of style that uh, is conducive for a leadership person. However, I think that our role is to engage. So whatever way that we can engage, we're going to engage. So I'm experimenting this, okay? So some of them you know, may work and some of them may not work, but let's see it. So in grantsmanship, I want you to, to learn what my concept is, how to compete, and ultimately how to win. Okay, so I share with you. I mean, if you talk about writing grants, <laughs> it's not a sexy topic. It's painful, painful topic. But I think that we can make it a bit interesting. And I'm not going to be able to share with you all the intricate natures about writing a grant because that's going to be ours. However, I want to give you a general concept so that you know what constitutes a competitive grant and the process to winning things. It is a stressful, stressful process. And um, when I read some of the PSF grants and some other grants, I feel that people do not know it is an evolving process. <laughs> they think that it's a weekend thing and submit something. They say, yeah, I'm going to win. I do not think it's a weekend process. If you want money, if you want money, you're going to have to do it. You have to write grants. And by definition, if you're requesting grant funding, you don't have money. And we don't apply for grants for the sake of getting money. Okay, I know that it's part of the money out there, everybody's competing, but the reason you're getting grants is because you need the money to do the project. Just applying for grants to get money for yourself is not the right process because it is very involving. So if you're passionate about your study, you're getting grants to do your study. Good grantsmanship is becoming very important because we all know funding is very tough. At the NIH, the funding is, the first submission is less than 10%, and these are the top of the top of the top. PSF, the funding is also very, very difficult. I don't, I don't know the statistics, but I would say 25% of the grants get funded, which means that a lot of people are spending a lot of time and writing grants, but you know, a quarter, three quarters of them did not get funded. And why is that? Let's talk about that. So the NIH funding, in which is a metric for academic success, really the metric for academic success. When you have something given to you by the NIH, you have made it to the echelon of academic powers. And at Michigan, we are very proud because we're the top institutions. We continue to be ranked in the top 10, if not top 5, in NIH funding. And, and we mentor many people to get grants. But if you look at this, NIH funding has not changed for many years now. 31 billion. Seems like a lot of money, but 31 billion when compared to our defense, 780 billion, really, really pale. And it's our crown jewel for the Americans. Uh, leadership in the, in the world. $31 billion buy you a lot of innovations. But you can see that people are competing very aggressively. You can see the number of applicants continue to go up. And the funding line, if you look right here, continue to be the same. Which means that many of the grants, meritorious grants, were not funded. So, if you want to compete, you've got to be like Alex. Alex wants to sell lemonade. And he did not, 
he did not just say, I want to sell lemonade. What did he do? He had a lemonade stand, he smiled at you, he has a bunch of enticing things. I cannot attest for the quality of his lemonade. However, you know, he has beautiful signs. He did his homework. He wanted to sell you lemonade. Okay? So when you apply for grants, you got to be like Alex. You have to have a dedication like him for pediatric cancer care. If you want to write grants, you got to start preparing now. Um, I think that our residents are all preparing in some way in not only writing, but also competing and learning how to write grants because it is a long process. The first grant I wrote for the NIH competed, um, we started the idea about eight years ago. Eight years ago to build pilot data, to write papers, to support ultimate hypotheses that would lead to funding starting the project eight years ago. So it is a long process. And this is not a hyperbole when you see the little turtle trying to go to the ocean. This is exactly what we're doing. There's no, there's no illusion that, that it's going to happen. However, however, um, if one does not compete like so-called get into the ocean like this turtle, it would be a long process. So before you start, let's, let's look at this. You want to look at the big picture? You really have to have someone who has gone through the process to tell you, you know, what are the intricate natures of writing grants. And now I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. So what is grant application? It specifies research goals and projects to accomplish them. You have an idea. You want to get funded. You want to make the idea into fruition. We need to communicate a need for project. You're selling something. Okay? You're selling something to the reviewers, the NIH, or someone. You want to demonstrate the capacity and qualification. It's going to be about you. It's everything about you. Why would somebody want to give you money? Because they trust you. They think that you can change the society. They think that you have the ability. They're giving money to you. It's all about you, really, and your team. Proposes a timeline and resources necessary to complete the project. It's a process. In five years, I'm going to deliver this to the PSF or the NIH. Which means that the research goals and proposed, proposed project must be clearly defined before a grant can be selected. So, typical things. What's the problem? What are you trying to solve? What are you going to do about it? And what sh why should you get the money to do that? It's these three criteria is what we all look at and what I look at when I see a grant application. These three things. You've got to be able to articulate those three things. I cannot be guessing. If after the first page I have no idea what's the problem, <laughs> what you can do about it, and why should you get the money, it's actually making it an easy day for me because then I'm moving to the next one that I can read. Okay? Absolute most important part of the process um, so this last sentence is actually interesting. You know that I push our people in elegant writing. Uh, Shay know about it. I don't know where Avi is, but we and all the people back there, we ask for elegant writing. But elegant writing really cannot make up for unclear ideas. Of course, poor writing make it easy because poor writing really doesn't matter how good your ideas is. Poor writing is still poor writing. So you want to perform an extensive literature search. And this is a slide that uh, I think is useful. Thank you for not doing research that has been done already. There's too many repetitions of the same thing over and over again. So before you have an idea, and before you have many ideas, you've got to know the literature call. You have to be an expert in whatever field you're doing so that when you cite them, when you talk about them, and I talk to the international people as well, when you do your projects, you've got to be an expert. It's not kind of, I kind of know it kind of stuff, because people who review your grants really know it. Kind of know it essentially put you in a disadvantage. So you have to know your topic in and out. OK, so. Good? <laughs> Hip? All right. Boy, it took me a while to find all these slides. Well, actually, it took my staff a, a while to find all these slides. Know the literature in your field, because duplication is uh, waste. And uh, it's quite surprising, given, the, um, given how dress is so important that they will buy from the same rack. But they all look good. They all look good. But still, repetition, repetition is a waste. Duplication is not good. OK, you want to find a niche. A niche is a specific area within your field. You want to be distinctive. You want to be noticed. You want to be different from the next person, which means that you got to do a project that is a bit unique. And we have the advantage in plastic surgery or even hand surgery in which everything we do is quite unique. 
okay? Because we're innovative specialty. We make things. We design new operations. We make new implants, new devices. So everything we do is innovative. The question is that how can you separate yourself from the next person? And the thing is that in plastic surgery or uh, hand surgery, I don't think you really need to separate yourself from the next person because there's no next person in the field, okay? Which means that you're already in an innovative specialty, okay? Internal medicine, everybody's applying for NIH grants. So distinguish one from the other is very, very difficult. But in plastic surgery, if you apply for NIH grants, you're essentially in a unique area of competition. You want to identify areas within your field experience and interests that require further investigation, something that can move science. So how do you find a niche? How do you find a niche? And, and our residents have the advantages that you already found a niche because you continue to work on projects, you continue to write papers, you interact with different people, you have faculty who are very interested in your academic career. You already kind of foster your niche towards a particular area, okay? So, you know, Katie has gotten a niche in, um, in general reassignment surgery. You know, Shay has found a niche in health policy. You know, as you get more mature, you'll find an area that you're very really passionate about. And you've got to have passion in what you're doing. But you can talk to your peers, talk to each other, and kind of say, you know, what do you think of this idea? Okay, don't be afraid to get shot down because you're going to start exploring and find your niche. You, and then after you expand everything you're doing, you're going to narrow it down to a specific area, and your niche will provide 10 years of research material. And I think 10 years is quite reasonable because all the projects, the rheumatoid project started eight, nine years ago. It's really a 10-year process. We're actually finishing the last recruiting of a few patients with seven, eight-year follow-up and that's a 10-year journey. We started our dissertative journey about maybe six years ago, and we're moving in that direction in 10 years. We're starting our health policy and outcomes research and national agenda with, uh, with uh, Shay, and then with, uh, with Dr. Walji, and then with, Dr. with Avi, and that started about you know, five, six years ago, and it's gonna be maybe a 20-year journey. So narrow your interests and be persistent and pursue that goal. Now you need to assess your research capacity, cap capability. What can you do? How ambitious can you be? Okay, and that's sequential. Start slow, start with pilot project, a few patients, moving up to level four evidence, level three, and ultimately your ultimate prize is gonna be this big, big trial, okay? Now I'm talking about clinical studies. The basic science may be a bit different, but it's still sequential. And of course, find out what research has been done and what has not been done. Run your idea by a seasoned investigator, okay? I mean, I remember this one, watch, you know, yes. Now you can see the kind of taste I have in, uh, in my movies. It was, I, was, I was making this one, it took me a while to find this one, my wife walked by, that's, a, that's when she went crazy on me. <laughs> You're gonna present this to whom? To, your, to my residents, yeah. And also to the whole country, <laughs> oh God, no good. But, but the thing is, I remember this one because it was frozen for how many years, right? And he woke up and said, well, let's, let's uh, you know, Prince Charles uh, have a divorce. I was like, uh, that already happened. Uh, you know, so, so it's kind of as if you're frozen for 20 years and give somebody, I want to study the vascularity of Latissimus Dorsey. No, no. <laughs> There's 100 papers on that, okay? So... So you need to pass your ideas by somebody experienced, and then if they look at you, kind of say, uh, that has been done already. Well, then move on. Okay, so finding a niche, and, and all of us will throw you little bones to be sure that you're on the right track. Good? Good. Okay. Katie, Katie is my, I look at Katie's face, face to kind of see whether I am going up or going down quickly. <laughs> okay, project development. How do you develop a project? Once you find a niche, you have an idea, and you know that it's the right idea, pursue it. So many years ago, when I was a junior faculty member, I came to this university, I have no idea what I'm doing. I want to do outcomes, but I do not know what that is. Nobody knows what that is. However, we have the top-notch rheumatoid arthritis program in the country, in the world. And I figured, rheumatoid arthritis, hand surgery, there's a niche there. I want to study outcomes for rheumatoid hand procedures. And at that time, it's virtually devoid of any type of scientific data on hand surgery. So I partner with my rheumatologist and I develop a specific aim that I want to look at implant arthroplasties, which is very common at the time before the biologics. So it's an interesting topic to rheumatologists, also the hand surgeons of the country. And we have a testable hypothesis. Did the implant 
provide better quality of life for patients when compared to those who didn't have implanted the treatment medically. Simple, very simple. Anyone can understand it. And it's unmet need because there's virtually no studies like this at that time, and there's no collaborative study or multi centers trials. Okay? And it's feasible because we have a lot of patients here, and I recruited two other sites that have a lot of patients, the leading rheumatoid centers in Baltimore and also in England. So those three sites have been collaborating for close to 10 years, and we have the ability to do the operation, and it doesn't cost a lot of money to follow patients and manage up in scope. That's how the rheumatoid, the Sarah study, surgery of the arthroplasty for the rheumatoid hand started. So you formulate specific aims that address your specific questions. You gotta have a clear endpoint. What is gonna happen after one, two, five years? What's gonna happen is that we're gonna show that surgery is better than no surgery. Or we're gonna show that the other way around. Or even when there's no difference, it's still something important. Interrelated but not dependent on each other. Okay, this is key. You're gonna have specific aim one, two, and three. And, and some of the residents know this because I've told them this. So if my specific aim number one is that I want to develop an outcomes instrument, the Michigan Hand Outcomes Questionnaire. And number two, I want to use the Michigan Hand Outcomes Questionnaire to evaluate rheumatoid patients. And then the specific aim number three, I want to find out the economic consequence. What do you see the problem with that? The problem with that is that the aims are interrelated in some way, but it's dependent on each other. If aim number one fails, if I cannot prove that the Michigan questionnaire is useful for rheumatoid patients, then aim number two is over. Aim number three is over. <clears throat> so all these aims are connected in some way. However, they should not be totally dependent on the success of each other. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now you're ready to go. You have a brilliant idea, you have ambition. Can you start writing? Oh, so fast. Football season is coming. We're going to win the national championship. I said that last year. In fact, I said that the year before. In fact, I said that the last 10 years. So, so what, I have, what happened? My son is 13, so I have to uh, show him our videos so from 1997 when we actually won the national championship. I said, Dad did not lie to you. We used to be very good, and we're going to be just as good. So, Paul, we're going to win it this year, right? <laughs> Dr. Sardona is intimately involved in our athletic program, so uh, we're counting on his sage advice to make us get there. Okay, so where are you going to apply? Before you apply, you got to think, okay, I have a brilliant idea, where can I go? Oh yes, I have a brilliant idea, let me go for the NIH. Well, that's a bit uh, difficult. You cannot go from here to there, which is what I did, because nobody told me that. I cannot go from a junior faculty straight to the NIH. However, that's a different talk, a different story. But, but you start with a f something lower and then still build your momentum all the way to the NIH level. And you, and you can kind of continue to hear my view about NIH because I think that in plastic surgery and even hand surgery, we're not just satisfied about getting foundation grants. We're not satisfied about getting small grants. And since we started the so-called uh, mentorship sessions that Paul Sedona has run and many of us have run and the fundamentals workshop, the number of NIH grants in our specialty has increased steadily every year because people are competing and getting them. And I think that if I were to say our residency program, half of you may be getting NIH grants in your, in your lifetime, which is a, a good testament of your fortitude. But for funding, we want to start internal, something small all the way to something big. Institution, look at our institution for institutional funding because you need pilot data to get some, some idea about what you're doing and then leverage that to get something bigger. So institutional funding for Department of Surgery, from the university, there's many funds for residents that you need to apply for that. And many of our people have done, including uh, Erica, who got the Michelle Grant, and then a few other people. Um, so these are some of the so-called typical examples of grants at the bottom that we can apply for. And after that, once you have some idea what you're doing, you move up to a foundation, professional organization. And um, there's two general types, um, funding pilot projects. And we ask people when they apply for PSF grants to articulate exactly where this is gonna go next. 
if they say that this project ends right here and this is it, it's too limited in scope. We're really not interested in that. We want everyone who apply for NA for, uh, PSF grants to be able to leverage that to go to the next level. And that's something that one need to consider. The funding is usually one, two, typically not three years, but um, you can ask for three years for no cost extension because some studies are much longer. And these are some, some of the mechanisms. I think that at, we always have a calendar in which we note every single grant deadline so we can start at least six months ahead. Okay? It's not possible, and I want to share with you that the grant is due next week, and they say, oh, Dr. Chung, you know, can we write a grant for this? Uh, no, because we're not going to leverage our reputation for something that is, that is haphazard. It has to be at least six months from the deadline. Even for, I don't even care, even for $5, we start six months because everything we send out is going to be as perfect as possible. So federal grants, I know that for residents and for the national audience, federal grants may be a bit um, premature to talk about, but let's talk about that. Let's see what is in the future for us. You have two types. You have so-called the R1s, which means that R01s, which means that you just apply. Okay? The US is quite magnanimous, as that's why we're so strong. We will take your idea and find you, rather than we tell you what you want to do. And most of these grants, the salary support is average, about 20 to 25 percent, and most of the funds are used for your projects. And there is something called a Career Development Award, K Award, in which Dr. Walji has gotten an internal K Award, is going to get uh, most likely a national award from the NIH. Um, Erica is going to apply for those things, and Shea and some of the other people. It gives you salary support. Why is salary support important? Because as a surgeon, you're busy, and you've got to be protected in some way, not only to do surgery, to take care of patients, but you need time to think and cultivate your career so you can apply for something bigger, called a K Award. <clears throat> so anything, regardless of what it is, some of these awards, anything with R is something to just apply. You just ask the government for things, and some of these are not a lot of money, like R3 is only $50,000 a year, but everything with the R, Everything with a K, they review it just like it's an R1. The level of competition is so keen that even though it's not a matter of how much money you apply, you cannot assume that if you apply for grants that's $5,000, you're going to give them a $5,000 work grant. Because the competition, even for $5,000, is very keen, then unless you write your grant exactly as good as an R1, okay, and I push our people when they apply for anything, I, as I said it again, I don't even care if it's $5. It has to be as outstanding as possible, like an NIH grant, okay, because the competition is that key. So you cannot judge, you cannot titrate your grant quality based on the amount of money you're applying for. It all has to be the top notch. So the career development and all these things down there, some are for basic science, the KO1, KO2, KO8, basic science, and the other ones are for, um, for clinical studies. Private foundation. There are many private foundation grants that one can consider, and these grants, some of them are charities, some of them, such as Melinda Gates Foundation, they have a very specific focus. They want you to do specific things, such as HIV in Africa. Okay? So many of these sources are available, and they're also very, very competitive. And so these fundings are specific for geographic area, and they need to be sustainable. You've got to be able to show the foundation, because they're going to use your ideas and get more money from the donors and so forth. So some of the examples are Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Doris Duke Foundation, and some of the things in Michigan. <clears throat> and there are many other places they get money from. So there are a lot of sources for money. And when people say, oh, the money is tight, I don't subscribe to that. Yes, the money is tight. However, what is tight? The tight is your ideas, whether you have a good idea, or whether you're willing to push the idea, because everybody's applying. The money is there. It's whether you're going to win or you're not going to try. So playing in the game, at least try, is at least is winning in some ways, because you at least get through the front gate. So what type of funding is best for you and your project? Let's talk about that, OK? Let's talk about the grand scheme. Okay, thank you, Katie. So, so you started as a young investigator. You guys are probably too young to know Doogie Howser, right? Oh, you know that? That's good, yeah. So, 
He's a young, eager investigator out to change the world. So what's he going to get? He's going to get institutional grants. Start with something. Why is that? He doesn't need a lot of money. He needs private data. But he also needs to learn how to write a grant. Okay, so start with something slower. And then we move to more experience. A few. <laughs> it's crazy, right? A few more publications. Okay. Then what do you do? Could apply for some kind of a career award for the NIH. Okay. So you know, that's what Dr. Waji is doing. That's what Erica is doing. Shane may be doing that. Avi may be doing that. Some of you may be doing that. Okay. And then what happened next is that when you are older and more experienced, what do you go for? You already have a K award. Now you're going for an R1. You're going to get something bigger, something national, okay, an NIH grant. Okay? And then now you are really old. <laughs> you either fade away and say, I'm done because I just cannot go to a red race, or the expectation at Michigan is that you renew your R1 and get more R1s because now you have a lot of people working with you. They're all depending on you to leverage a big industry of research so that everybody can push the science, everybody can be successful. So somebody in a senior position has a lot of stresses in the sense that they have a lot of people depending on their successes. They need to get more R1s so they can apply for things. They need to renew the R1. Getting the first R1 is very exciting. However, it doesn't really put one in the elite group until one renew that. So Dr. Buckman has renewed his R1. They put him in a very, very distinct group because most people, they did the first thing and the results are not that imposing, they're tired, they kind of fade away. For one to compete again and get a renewal for another five years, it's a testament of one's fortitude. And secondly, the NIH really respect what you have done in the last five years. Okay, so that's good. All right. So these are our sequence and our staff helped me, including uh, who did this one? Who did this slide with Melissa? No, did, Melissa? Oh, Melissa did? Okay, she's not here. So, so Melissa is, you know, give me this kind of advices on how to be hip, and I leverage her advices to make this happen. Okay, so these are the sequence. If one wanted to think about the career, these are the sequence, okay? So, now you're ready to go. Okay, I told you not to, not to start yet because I want you to think about what your career goal is. But now you're ready to go and you can start writing. Yes. Let's start writing. Let's start figuring out what to do. Okay? Now we go to the meat of this. So writing a successful grant proposal. Okay, what does that mean? So this is a cartoon. I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realized that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an, in an intimidating and impenetrable fog. When I see my book report, the dynamics of interbeing and monological imperatives and Dick and Smith, a study of psychic translational gender mode. Yes. This is not too far-fetched. You guys who have worked with me understand where I'm coming from. Does that bring back uh, some memories, Jay? Yeah. <laughs> this is what happened. This is actually, that's why you need a mentor, okay? Because people in academia, and I see this regularly, they need big words, big complex sentences. You know, you understand what I'm saying, right? You are not a conversing. When you converse in the medium of words, you got to have the same kind of connection as I am with you now. You cannot be writing this kind of stuff because immediately when I see this, it's over. Okay? And this have happened to beginning writers because they're insecure about their ability to write. And then they write in a very comfortable fashion and we have to tone them down. And then later on, they start getting more assurance and much more confidence and they write in so-called elegant but with clarity. So don't let Dr. Chong call you out because you know, I'm going to call you out. A perfect example. So Xie has a standard has this intellect of standard deviation of two standard deviations above everybody. So when you started working and writing on stuff with me, 
I have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> because I am a normal person, and he's way up here, and we cannot connect. So we had to bring him down to my level, and right in the level, I understand. And then after that, you know, after six years, <laughs> we under each four, okay. Four years, we understand each other perfectly because he writes with clarity, elegance, everything that's, that he understands. Okay? And then it's very important that he help the junior people in their ability to write because I have post-traumatic stress disorder after teaching these writing things for many years. Uh, I just need a medium. I need somebody to be in the middle. So pretentiousness, and uh, I use that word in a kind of loving way, your writing is pretentious. Sounds kind of harsh, right? But uh, <laughs> cannot be pretentious when you write grants. Uh, follow the instructions. Okay. This is something we need to know about because every grant mechanism has some instructions. However, to make it simple, the PSF and also the hand surgery, I was the research director for a plastic surgery, now research director for hand surgery, in which we just want to standardize everything based on NIH format. Why is that? because we don't want to have a new format because our goal is for people to understand the NIH process. So everything is NIH, so know the NIH format because NIH is very strict about page limit. They tell you 10 pages, if you go 10.5, it's over. They're not gonna review this in the trash because you cannot read the instructions. They give you word limits, they actually give you margins. You need to have, I can't remember what it is, but you need to have you know, half inch margin on either side. If you're over the margin, it's over, it's in the trash. So they're not sympathetic, because why? They have a whole package of everything come in. So if you cannot follow instructions, you already weed it out. So follow the instructions. So I'm gonna give you some statistics. So follow the instructions. In 2005, 20% of the proposals submitted to NIH were rejected before review due to formatting issues. 20%, and these are top-notch people. And why is that? I don't think there's check and balances within the system. <clears throat> check and balances in which they're relying on one or two people checking the whole thing. But any time a grant goes out, there's usually two or three. More than that, checking every single uh, part of the grant. Not only the page limit, but every single comma, every single word needs to be as perfect as we can. So follow the instructions. If something's not clear, you need to find out from someone. You need to find out from your staff. You need to find out from someone who has done it. Okay? And, uh, and this, this thing is actually very interesting because, because I'm a surgeon, we're all surgeons, and my wife assumed that, um, that I can fix everything. And she would go to IKEA and buy me the box. I want a cabinet, so make this. The most painful process is to look at 50 steps. I do that regularly in surgery. I don't want to do 50 steps. So you start assembling things and find out that, oh, what are these two pieces here? Where do they go? You find out that they're actually the central portion of that cabinet. And now you have to take everything apart. Follow the instructions. Go through every step in the NIH grant. Start early. Know your institution's internal review process. Institutions have some deadlines. Anytime you want to apply for grants, somebody know about it. Because they will tell you, by this day, I want this. By this day, because you need signatures. You need approvals. So know the institutional's requirement. And then allow time to submit. If the deadline is at 12 o'clock on Monday, OK? You don't send your grant at 8 a.m. on Monday. You send it on a Friday. Hopefully, there'll be a few days to catch something, and then you have some latitude. And if you send it at 8 o'clock and something don't go right, and then your grant go in at 1 o'clock, well, wait six months, and that's a problem. So start early. Okay. Writing grants is, should be a so-called comfortable intellectual, enjoyable process. I know it's, it's, uh, it's a, bit, uh, uh, a bit conflicting to say it's enjoyable, uh, because when you have a set deadline, it's not enjoyable. But it's, it's something, it's a synthesis of your life's event that you want to share with someone. So you have to think about it. You have to make this a calm, enjoyable process. So typically what we do is that we finish the grants, the best thing we can do, and we have one month left to submit. And what we do is that everybody come down, take a break, do other things, and come back and look at the grant with a fresh eyes so that before you send out, you will have a, a very clear perspective. Because you work so intensely, you've got to have a little break during that time. Now, get writing. Writing is difficult. 
the first few words is difficult. And usually what I tell my people is that, you know what, just write some nonsense, okay? Just write something. I mean, if you start typing, if you start dictating, start saying something, at least you have started, at least some words on a blank page, okay? It doesn't have to be coherent, but start something. Sometimes people just say, oh, the first word, let me make the first word very clear. Um, I, yeah, 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 good, I. Uh, second word, M, <laughs> you know? That kind of pace is not gonna do it. So start writing something, anything, and put it on print. So just like writing a paper, who are you trying to impress here when you write something? You're trying to impress the reviewers. These are three people, you don't know who they are, who's gonna read your grant. Write with their, their vision or their interest in mind, okay? Maybe just think of me, you know, I'm gonna read your grant, okay? What does Dr. Chang think about my grant? You want to anticipate, address the questions that may arise as reviewers read your proposal. And I'm going to share with you how I evaluate these things because I have a lot of grants that I review regularly. I want to be efficient. I want to know whether this one's separate from the other pile, whether this one's distinctive, whether this is one a good one that I'm going to advocate for. Some of the people, in fact, I think that many of the people, particularly in NIH, are not content experts in your field because they get volunteers, they select people for the expertise, but there's so many grants that Sometimes I get grants on, I don't know, zebrafish, okay? I don't know about zebrafish. However, I do know what grantsmanship is. When somebody working on zebrafish submitted a grant to me I was assigned and can write in a way that I can understand, that person get a huge, huge boost in score just because they write it with my comfort and my understanding in place. So memorize these. This is very important. Okay, well, I don't memorize this now, but look at this. But know this. You want to know what the game is, okay? So in football, I mean, some of you may not watch football, but some of you do. You know that you have to get 10 yards every time, right? Okay, if you do not know a rule and you think, well, I'll get eight yards. Well, okay, you're not going to make the first down, okay? You got to get 10 yards. <laughs> you got to know, you got to know the criteria. So what is this? Significance. It's not statistical significance. Significance means why is it important? What, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna cure cancer. That's significant. That's a big deal. Well, approach. I'm gonna, cross, I'm gonna cure cancer by giving you capsule. Your approach is wrong. I don't think it's gonna happen, okay? So the approach is not good. So you gotta have a good approach. Innovation, what is new? It's what you're proposing is new. So, when we first do the, started the rheumatoid arthritis grant, there's no collaboration at all across institutions. We're the first one that actually have a multi-center collaboration, an international collaboration. It's only three centers, okay? Nowadays, it's not gonna be novel. Now we have a 25-center study with 60 hand surgeons involved. Now, that's innovation. However, you know, 10 years ago, three centers, international collaboration is innovation. So, I think that in plastic surgery and hand surgery, anytime you can have a collaboration among centers, multiple people, those are something unique in our specialty. Probably not in internal medicine, but in surgery, it's unique. Investigators. So investigators. Because we're capturing this video, typically in our conferences, we interact so that I can get a pulse of what they're thinking and whether they understand what I'm saying, but because you're capturing these things, so the interaction is pretty much a facial kind of things. But We'll try it next time. We'll try something much more innovative. The investigators, okay, they want to see whether you have it. They want to see whether they want to support you. And I'm going to show you what they're looking for in terms of the investigator criteria. Environment, your entire place. So if you submit something from University of Michigan, Stanford, uh, Hopkins, the environment is usually not a factor because there's so many good people around you that you're going to be good. However, in certain places, the environment may be a problem because you don't have the infrastructure, maybe the collaborators to work with. So environment is also important. These are the five things that people judge your grant with. So you gotta evaluate each one of them and understand each one of them. Okay, let's go to the comment sections. Are you guys okay? Still staying awake? All right. Specific aims. Our people know what that means, because when they do a project, I usually ask them, give me your first page, 
Okay, I assume they understand. If they don't understand, they better start asking each other what that means. Because I want to see three paragraphs of introduction. I want to see specific aim one, two, and three. Based on that first page, then the rest of them are built on that first page. The rest of them are built on answering the five criteria and answering these, the questions of interest, aim one, two, and three. So that one page is very important. We don't write anything else until that one page is very, very clear and clean. Okay, and people sitting in the back, you understand, right? That one page. If you have a reposing one page, then the rest is easy. You just build on that one page. So three paragraphs, two or three statements of main objective of your proposal, and then followed by hypothesis. So what do I want to see? The first paragraph is the problem. Why is it a problem? It costs a nation $500 billion, and we have death in the range of this because of this problem. Well, that is important. People need to know. If it's curing five people, it's still important, but it may not be as imposing. The target population, who are you dealing with? What do you plan to do? And how do you plan to do it? Outcomes, how do you measure outcomes? Everything is based on patient-centered outcomes. You gotta know what outcomes is. And then you end with a paragraph, the third paragraph, indicating how the research will impact your field or the nation or the society. Okay. Then, by reading that three paragraphs, I get a sense of whether your idea is innovative and whether you know what you're doing. And then, this is a very typical format that we have, specifically AIM 1, 2, and 3. Okay. AIM 1, we will compare the global function of rheumatoid patients who undergo MCP arthroplasty versus those who do not. Very simple, anybody can understand that. Even though you're not a rheumatologist or hand surgeon, you understand that, okay? Rationale, why am I doing that? Assess whether improvement in hand function lead to overall improvement in quality of life. Previous studies have not assessed quality of life being validated question. I mean, this is from 10 years ago, okay? I don't know whether it's still as good as today, but it's clear, okay? We don't know whether the quality of life is improved with joint replacement. And then the hypothesis, everything, everything you study need to be tested in some way. You cannot say, I want to see how joint replacements are doing in patients. Well, you're not testing anything. You're kind of exploring, you're kind of, okay, that may be okay in very preliminary applications, but certainly not okay in something much more competitive. So rheumatoid patients underwent joint replacement have significant improvement in global functioning compared to patients who doesn't. Anybody can say, you can test that. A is better than B, B is better than C, okay? That's what I want to see in the specific aims, okay? Look at this. In 2005 study, problems were identified in specific aims in 45% of R1 submitted to the NIH. That's a lot. When they look at the first page, half of them have problems. That's a big deal because that's the first page people look at. And why is that? The goals are overstated. You're blowing up your study. You're making too ambitious claims about things. Overly ambitious and realistic. I want to cure cancer. Okay, well, it's, yeah, we all want to do that, but you gotta, it's, it's difficult. Poorly focused and adequate conceptualized. It's all the place. It's not coherent. Hypotheses not clearly articulated. I think that's one of the clear, one of the most common things. You don't have a hypothesis you can test. Okay, so that first page. Background. Now, why is the background? We know this already. The background is you know, need to know the literature, okay? This is the time for you to understand the field, to tell people that you're an expert. You know everything in the field. And sometimes they will send a grant. For example, for PSF, if you're gonna write something on hand surgery outcomes, most likely I'm gonna get it. So there's some grantsmanship in the background materials because you need to know what I have done. You anticipated that Dr. Chong is gonna get your grant, which means that you got to at least know what he has done and what people around him has done. So that, that when he review it, you kind of say, at least you know that the reviewers are expert, content expert in your specialty, in your area. So 2005 study, same study, 5% proposal provides uh, too much background leaving, and then 5% in the National Kidney Foundation, which is a big foundation for kidney problems. Only 5%, which means the background area is the easiest part for you to write. Just because all the stuff is out there, okay? It's for you to synthesize. So the background material is not too much of a problem, in a sense. Significance, okay. So, significance. When you write your grant, 
don't let the reviewers guess what you're doing. Tell them, the significance of my study is this, this, this. The innovation is this, this, this. Because they can be guessing, and you can be dancing around. It can be humble. However, if they do not know what you're doing, and you don't call out to them, because they read very fast. There's a lot of grants. Typically, they get 15 of them, 20 of them, which means that tell them the significance is this. You want to tell them the population that will benefit from the study and tailor your significance section to the mission of the funding agency. Okay? If you apply for PSF, you've got to have some plastic surgery-related themes. Okay? Uh, if it's not, then it's most likely it would not interest your reviewers. So call them out. Tell them exactly where it is. The significance also equals a so what question. So what? You always ask your question, so what? Why are we doing this? Does this project address an important problem? We talked about this already. I'm going to harp on this again. What impact is the study likely to have on the field? And what impact likely on society? Okay. Always ask the so what question. You ask yourself the so what question, but you also go, for example, Shay can go to Kelly. What's Kelly? To ask about the so what question. You ask each other. You know, this is my idea. Tell me what you think. Did I answer the so what question? So 36% of proposal had problems in this area. So what? Because the so what question is very hard to ask and very hard to answer. Just because it's difficult to be so innovative that your project is so distinctive. That's why 36% had problems and National Kidney Foundation 12% had problems. If you don't tell the reviewers why your project is important, they will not know and the reviewers should not have to guess. Approach. Now you pass the so what question. Okay, now your significance is established. Now you have to prove it. So describe how you approach the project in detail. You got to know about. So you know, I didn't focus on basic science because it's not what I do. But I think that is still translatable to basic science. You want to discuss everything from patient recruitment, data collection, statistical analysis. Okay, and if you're not an expert in statistics, get one. So when I wrote that, I kind of say, you know what? Who is an expert in statistics anyway? Get one. If you're going to do any kind of study, get a statistician. And I, from personal experience, I have a statistician that worked with me for close to two decades. And when she was involved very early, I never have comments about statistical analysis, which is a key component. And then one or two times, we got a little bit uh, flippant and think that we're, we're hot and we're really good. So I said, ah, we don't need Dr. Kim to be involved. We write our own statistics. Then we got torn apart, okay? Which means that for proof of, for proof, proof um, get a statistician early in your project. Okay, that would be very, very important. Participant recruitment, inclusion, exclusion criteria, timeline, limitations, these are sections that should be covered in your approach, particularly for clinical studies. And then people do not like to read a lot of words. Okay, nowadays, even one of my colleagues, who is one of the deans, the senior associate dean, and I will talk about grantsmanship, and he has, I don't know, for NIH grants or something. He changed the way he write his grants in the sense that he put a lot of cartoons. He put a lot of visual things because visual things is easier for people to digest. In the past, we write pages and pages of words. Nowadays, he interspersed them with cartoons and make it more lively, and that's grantsmanship. Okay? Not the cartoons I show you about Austin Power and things. If you do that in the grants, it's over. Okay? I'm trying to be hip to engage with you, but if you take, okay, let me make it clear. Do not be hip when you write grants. Okay? Because people who review your grants are serious people. This is science, serious things. So if you put, uh, try to be hip in these grants, it's pretty much over. <laughs> so it's only good for presentations, but not in grants. Good? Research methods is not the same as protocol. Whenever we do a study, we need to have a protocol. What's the, what's the usefulness of a protocol? Protocol is for everybody in the lab, everybody in your group involved in the study to follow everything specifically and, and you know, line by line by line. So there's no deviation because that's what you want to do. However, if you put a protocol as a research method, that's over because it, was so, it would be so detailed that reviewers would be not happy. We're reading a lot of stuff. So the research methods should be something elegant easy to understand, visual things, flow charts. People can look at them and in a very short time understand everything that you're doing. Your grant is a marketing document to sell funders on your project. Okay? Remember Alex? 
Alex wants to sell you lemonade, okay? He's giving you all the ingredients, all the things to sell you lemonade, all right? What you need to do is you need to make it clear how you're gonna sell your lemonade by making it elegant and easy to understand. It should be engaging, easy to read as the rest of the grants. Walk the reviewers through methods and analyses you use and focus, continue to focus on the significance of innovation. Okay. Sometimes we say, I say it three times or four times, not because I think that reviewers can understand things, but I want them to continue to focus on what I'm trying to show them. At the end of the section, reviewers should have answers to the following questions. Are the study designs and methods feasible and appropriate for the results desired? Are the statistical methods sufficient to detect any possible results? Does the applicant acknowledge potential problems or alternative tactics? Number three is critical. There's no perfect grant. There's always going to be problems. So it's very, very critical, important that at, at the at so-called the latter part of your proposal, that you have a section on limitations, on limitations and plans to overcome them. Because as the reviewers start reading your grants, limitations will start coming. What about this? What about this? Hopefully you address them. However, you need to have such foresight to understand what the reviewers are thinking and say, yes, I, I know that um, we may have poor patient recruitment. If that happens, we evaluate in three months and we'll go to five different places and get these. You gotta have some strategy to overcome these limitations, okay? If you have articulated limitations and the plans to overcome them, they're sensible, that's ultimate grantsmanship because you are reading the reviewer's mind. Okay, so have that. 100% of proposals have problems with approach. Wow, this is a very difficult section to write, isn't it? 100% have problems with that. 76% have problems with the uh, National Kidney Foundation. And the reason, I think that I know the reason, because they just give you the protocol. They just write it and kind of say, this, this is just very dry. It's all have problems. You gotta make it elegant and simple to understand. Innovation, why so special? Your novel concepts, approaches, how is that going to be improvement over the existing things, provide evidence of literature, explain why the innovative approach is better than the status quo. Okay, that's another criteria. At the end of your proposal, they will ask a question. Is this original? I know we talked about that. Let's talk about it again. Is this original? Does a project develop or use novel concepts, techniques, methods, whatever, whatever? What's so special? Okay. So innovation, the Kidney Foundation is really not a problem because this is a large foundation and most of the projects that would actually go through initial screening at least have some type of uh, new ideas. Otherwise, people would not even sub you know, submit them. But I suspect that with very so-called new grants at the PSF level, I think innovation is a big problem. It's not common that we see an innovative grant, so think about that carefully. I know that it's cliche again, but I think outside the box, innovation is key, okay? But then you cannot be too crazy, too innovative. There's, there is a mechanism in the NIH in which they want to see your most crazy ideas, okay? Because NIH is very conservative. They want to see a project that's doable, okay? That will follow a recipe and that will yield some kind of a result. That's too predictable. In order to push science, I think that sometimes, you know, we gotta get a, a horse that, um, that looks, doesn't look so hot when it's trotting around the field, but can really win because it's very unusual. We've got to think outside the box sometimes. So in plastic surgery, in the foundation, occasionally we take a radical idea, kind of say, let's try this, okay? If one out of five are becoming successful, then it's a win. We're not talking about five out of five, but we need to take some chances, particularly in grants. Preliminary studies, this is a common question, okay? You need preliminary studies, and the Plastic Surgery Foundation we kind of tell them, particular pilot mechanism that's 10,000, we say, well, you don't need pilot data. Okay, I continue to tell people, present pilot data if you have them. Well, let me put it this way. In other words, have pilot data, <laughs> okay? When they tell you you don't need pilot data, everybody is putting pilot data in there. So if you don't have pilot data, you're already behind. So just because they say it's a pilot project, you don't need pilot data, present something you have done, something that justify what you're doing, okay? So always think about what you can present and how can you be competitive? Now let's talk about you, you, all of you. Be sure the preliminary studies you're highlighting are directly clearly related to the proposed study, okay? If I were to write a grant 
on uh, you know, zebrafish, it's over. I mean, I don't even care how good it is because I have no background in that. Make sure that it's synergistic with your training and your background. Emphasize prior studies that you and your mentors have successfully completed. Everything is sequential. You must have done four or five years of work, okay, leading to an NIH grant. You must have done, you must have published a few papers to indicate that you're capable of writing papers and doing projects before you send a PSF grant. If you send a PSF grant, I don't even care whether it's pilot study or five dollar study. If you have zero publications, forget it. I mean, you have not written a single paper. How can I be sure that you can write a, you can do a project? Even though the project may look so beautiful, when I look at that, we all know that. We all seasoned investigators, Dr. Sudana know this, is that somebody cut and paste for you and send it in. It's not your original work because you have not have the track record to be successful. So if you have aspiration to go to a certain level, make sure that you're preparing for that. Okay, so what does that mean? Get a training. If you're gonna be a top-notch expert in something, in neurophysiology or in biomechanics or something, get training. Have it and get training so that you have a line in your CV, in your bio sketch, indicating that you have a degree in this, 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 this. You have spent three years doing this. It's very important. It's critical that you have done that. So Lee's secretary, I don't know, I think many of you know her. She was our medical student, like probably the number one pick in the country. She wanted to do a PhD in health services research as part of the Robert Johnson Scholar. She asked me, is it feasible? Is it, is it something I should be doing? I said, by all means, do that. Because how many health services PhD person there are in the country? You know, when she finished her degree, when she published a paper she's capable of publishing, she would be so unique that there's no competition. Okay. If she write a good grant, you'll be funded because of so unique, her uniqueness. So get the appropriate training to justify the support. Key thing is, what's so special about you? They give somebody money, okay? Three people, they're giving you, you know, try to choose between, you know, these three, among these three people. You gotta be able to test how special you are. And it only comes by having additional training and build your CV and be competitive. So if, you know, Shay has suffered through working with me, when he submitted a grant, it's pretty much uh, a distinctive grant because nobody's going to be like him. Don't you think? <laughs> Good. At the end of your proposal, reviewers should have to answer the following question. Are the investigators experienced in the project? Is there the appropriate senior investigator? Not everybody is perfect. You cannot be one person doing the entire project. You can have collaborators. You cannot have, don't be dispersed. Don't get five collaborators and everybody around and nobody's in charge. You need to have a senior investigator who has worked with you and who has um, a track record of being successful. And that's critical because the, the team that you build around a grant is helpful. So NIH 2005 studies gained 2006, 8, and 7% had problems investigator. And this is selection bias already because, I mean, who are these people? These are the top-notch scientists in the country. So for them not to have built a CV commensurating with they're applying for these grants, it's, it's crazy. So they have done the homework, okay? So I'm telling you, and also the entire membership who are applying for grants, build your CV so that your, you can satisfy the investigator criteria. Potential problems, and I talked about this already, you know, nobody is perfect, you gotta have collaborators, and the harder it is, um, we have too many collaborators, it's hard to know who is in charge, so be selective, have a few key collaborators that can help you. When you have too many cooks in the grants, nobody is in charge, and that become a problem. So limitations, and we also talk about this, and good to harp on this again. All studies have limitations, You're limited to half page, towards the end, okay? And sometimes people misunderstood what I said. Limitations with solutions, but not self-flagellation, okay? Don't beat up your own grant, okay? I see that sometimes. Oh, this study can may not be successful because of this, 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 this. I'm just beating up too much. There's no need for that, okay? Just give them a few key points and solutions. Demonstrate an understanding of potential problems. Explain how the field would benefit even if your project does not demonstrate the expected result. A study, okay, if, it's, if you get A is better than B, perfect. If you get B better than A, perfect. If A is the same as B, 
it still has to be a unique finding. Okay? Do not put all the eggs, so-called eggs, in the basket in which that if A is not better than B, this entire thing is over. Okay? That is not, that's not a limitation you can overcome. Conclusions. Remind the reviewers the importance of your project and impact you have the field. Okay? Don't exaggerate. Come back to the first page. Articulate to them what is going on. So the environment is something we talk about. Okay? Different environments are useful. Emphasize the unique features of the institution. I mean, when you come to a big institution like Michigan, this is, we have a standard template that shows everything that we have. So it's really not a consideration. However, one needs to be cognizant of the environment it's important, okay, such as your physical plans, your collaborators, are there institutional support, and Michigan is really not a problem. Tons of institutional support for everything they want to do. And again, selection bias. When you apply for NIH, for National Kidney Foundation, institution is not a problem because these are all coming from top institutions in the country. Now, let's look at budget. Budget is not factored into our scores. I mean, do you see budget in any of the five things? No. Because they want to find science. They want to find science, and they don't really care about your budget as long as you're adhering to the same level. Except that you know, people are curious. I'm curious. I want to see whether you have a you know, sense of what's going on about your study. Because I would look at the budget very carefully as well. And the typical problem is, let me tell you the typical problem. So what's the budget? You want to tell people that you need this money to do these things, right? So you need cost for personnel your research assistant, you need equipment, you need supplies. Okay, and different organizations have different budgets. I made my budget as simple as possible. In my budget, there's only a few things. Okay, my salary support, my personnel, okay, patient incentive, occasional travel to present meetings, and that's really my budget. So when they look at a, a budget like that, there's usually no question, there's usually no concern because it's so simplistic. Okay? When the budget comes a problem, is that, well, the NIH um, have a budget and we don't have to talk about that. Because, because what happened is that NIH make it simple. If anything less than $250,000, you don't have to put a budget. They kind of say, it's, you know, 250000 to NIH per year is not big. So essentially, you kind of say, okay, whatever. When you have a big grants, then everything is detailed. And Dr. Soderna has submitted a Department of Defense grants that, you know, if you want a pencil, you got to tell them. Budget justification, you want to tell people what the money is used for, okay? You know what? Some of the grants are sunk. Why is that? Major institution, they ask for pencils. Oh my God, okay. You ask for pencils? You have no pencils in your pocket? They ask for notepads, okay. They ask for iPads, all of us have iPads. Okay, if you need it for certain things, yes, but they just ask for stuff that that you just look frivolous. They ask for computers. NIH doesn't find you computers. Everybody has computers, okay? You don't have computers. You don't ask for computers. Um, they ask for tons of trips, $50,000 on trips, you know? So even though it's not in the so-called funding mechanism scores, if I look at budget and somebody's doing that, I just think these guys are just frivolous, and this is not good. And they would kind of unconsciously score the grant worse. Okay, so even though budget is at the end, it's actually very, very important, particularly when you did it wrong. So justify what the personnel you have chosen, divide the justification into sections, and the personnel, uh, administrative overhead and things. Very straightforward, just make it as simple as possible, and don't ask, exorbitant amount of money, we actually do not need them because these are experienced investigators. They, they, this is what they do. They know exactly how much it costs to do certain projects. Ah, abstract. Abstract is the first thing that we all read. And we, we, you guys all know about this, right? It's the first thing we read and yet it's the last thing I talk about. Because you cannot write an abstract until everything is done. So you write a coherent summary. It's kind of the first day impression, okay? You look at somebody, they dress nice, they look nice. You know, even before they open their mouth, you have a really impression. Not that I have a lot of experience with that, but that's why people tell me. Anyway, your grand success will make a first impression, okay? And this is important, pay attention, okay? I told you guys multiple times, in fact, it's a rule in our laboratory that if you do that, I'm gonna be so crazy on you. If you cut and paste 
your abstract, if you, if you just take an introduction, if your first line, first paragraph introduction is the same as the first paragraph, even any part of your abstract, that grant is dead. I am not going to read that grant, it's over. Because you don't have the command of the language for you to write a separate something, okay? That is not grantsmanship, that's ultimate poor grantsmanship. So remember, remember that. Even your papers, your abstract need to be dis distinctive, okay? Distinctive and cannot be the same as your introduction, at least a few lines, because I will read the abstract, I will read the introduction, you know, how can you hide? I know exactly what's going on, you know, just cut and paste, okay? So these are good tips, remember that, it's very important tips. Easiest to write last when you have all your ideas solidified. This is a fun part of the thing because now you're taking a breather. You have done a magnificent job writing your grant. Now you want to share with people. You want to share with people in your abstract. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh my God, no wonder Mrs. Obama is upset with uh, our president. Sarkozy's okay, he's French, you know. They, they do that all the time. Anyway, let's, let's move on. Don't get, get in trouble. <laughs> so, right to excite. Okay, colorful, expressive language. If you, if you write a poem, if you write in your creative class, yes, expressive language, all that stuff, but really not in grants. But that doesn't mean the grant needs to be dull, it cannot be dull. It's, it's elegance is a virtue. You want to share your ideas to each other. And you talk to me, I understand what you're saying. I'm talking to you, you understand what I'm saying. That communication needs to be very, very crisp. You want to write an active voice as much as possible and not ruminate. Don't be afraid to write in first person. And each one of you have a style. Okay, as an editor, I don't want to change your style. I don't want your style to be my style because you have your unique style to express yourself. And I want to keep that and keep that in your grants. Be passionate. When I read your grant, I got to see passion. I want to see enthusiasm. I want to see that you really, really want this to happen. Okay, regardless of what I'm going to give money, you're going to make this happen because it's such an important part of your life and contribution to society. Persuasive, persuasive language, we may show, we will show. We will show. It's not may. We will do this. Above all, be clear and concise. And don't overwrite. Avoid flowery prose, um, and Brianna made a nice presentation on some of these things. As, uh, I don't know about this one, actually, from Churchill. Short words are best. They, want, they don't want you to use flowery languages. You know? If I have to look at dictionary a few times to see the so-called thesaurus menu that you put in your grant application, that's not good. Okay? Speak to me. Talk to me. Engage me. Okay, so... Katie's not seeing. Good. Louis Vuitton versus cheap knockoffs. Good. <laughs> so reviewers appreciate brevity. Um, they don't want to go through 10 pages. You need to have strong data, focused data, and don't pat your proposal. Don't, and just don't put down 100 citations where essentially people know that you're just listing them just to pat your references. They all need to mean something. So these are two portions of a grant that I wrote. The left one, trashed it. All kinds of words. Difficult to read, very difficult to understand. The right one, yes, because pictorial, nice. And if it's nowadays, I would have color. I would have cartoons. Not cartoons in the sense you saw, but I would have color. I would have much more engaging stuff, you know? Keep them attended. Write for the reviewers. Assume the reviewers are knowledgeable about your research, but not necessarily expert in your field. Don't make reviewers work harder than they have to. Make it easy for them, okay? When you make it easy for them, they, they will be very, very appreciative because you're not the only one they get. I mean, they will get 15 of them in any kind of setting. Make your grant as aesthetically pleasing as some, somebody unfamiliar with the project to review the grants because they can pick up the flaws in your grants. So give somebody enough time to go through them with you. So what happened if your grant is due and you don't have your best product? Don't send it. Why is that? Well, hopefully you won't get, I mean, if you follow my sequence, this will never happen, okay? But if this happened, don't do that. Because you have a track record. People remember who you are. I distinctly, I review a lot of grants, and from the Pasi Society Foundation, I remember quite a few people whose grants 
just doesn't match with who they are. And it could be a last minute thing, I don't know, but it was just not matching. This person you know, is so wonderfully gifted and all this stuff and present a grant that looked like that. Hmm. And then the next, next time this person sent a grant, I would still have this lingering effect of reading a poor grant from this person before. So if it's not your best work, don't send it. So submission and arrive at the funding agency and they'll be triaged to a, uh, they will be essentially look at all the formats and then some of them will go to the next round to be reviewed, others will be just sent back to you because you did not follow the instructions. And remember, these are the five criteria. And the NIH asks reviewers to keep the criteria in mind, but it is an inexact science, really. I mean, when I sit through the study sections, how do I know what somebody like it or not? They're all top grants, these are all outstanding products. It's a fine things, a few things. You know, how you express yourself, whether you have, a few years ago, when we submitted NIH grants that you eventually got funded, and after, I don't know how many revisions, and I'm gonna look at the last time, the second line of the first page has a misspelled word. I almost fell off my chair, I was like, my God, that's really, that's essentially over. When you have a misspelled word that early in the grants, it's a problem. So, so it's all focused on a few tiny things that I'm sharing with you about grantsmanship. So, you're trying to impress this um, reviewer who is uh, you know, kind of stand back and kind of say, what, what you know, am I asking you? We, what you say you're going to do make a difference, okay? And so, can you do what you say you're going to do in the amount of time with the amount of money provided? They're going to ask these two questions. Would it make a difference and can you actually do it? Okay. Tell them. So, they're very busy because I mean, we do research, do clinics, life duties and everything, everything from my standpoint, even for some of the references we have read, the decision is already crystallized in your first page, in your abstract in your first page, because they need to make summary decision very quickly in your first page, which means that, you know, Dr. Uh, Takanobu, Takanobu, right? He wrote his, he worked on his first page for how many months? <laughs> Three or four months? <laughs> Two months? Yeah, he worked on his first page for a long time just because it's how important it is. No review, no money. If um, it's triaged, then you have nothing. So what do we do at study section? We talk about your strength and weaknesses. If the strength overcome the weaknesses by a lot, then the score is gonna be much better, okay? If one start with the weaknesses because you have virtually no strength, then that is not a good sign. So the study section review it's not impartial because typically two people or three people drive the whole thing. In fact, if you have one champion, one person who champion your grant can sway the entire study section, which can consist of 20 people in the whole room because not everybody read the grant. In fact, most people have not read the grant. So it's actually a very, very, um, really not a fair process because it's all predicated on luck. You know, who gets yours? Of course, the best ones are always gonna be the best ones because if it's so wonderfully written and done, no matter who review it, it's gonna be wonderful, unless they actually hate your guts, which, which you know, you cannot control that. However, um, but the ones that are actually pretty good, it all depends on who you get, because somebody may champion it, and somebody may shut it down, and the person, and it will affect the entire study section on what it is. So it's not exactly science. So they use different criteria, and then what happened is that, okay, so I have $10 to give, and I get 200 grants. Well, I'm gonna start going like this. I'm gonna say, okay, the first one, the best score, gonna get it, and until I run out of money, then after that, it's not, no more. Which means that you will have a score, but you will also have a percentile score. Percentile score is that how do you rank with the entire group of people? And that is all predicated on how much money you have, okay? So just because you have a good score doesn't mean that you're gonna get funded because the money will run out. Just because you have a poor score doesn't mean that your grant is not funded because the study section may be so rigorous, and some of the study sections I'm engaged in are very, very tight. So all the grants are not in you know, the top things, but just because you are in the middle doesn't mean that you won't get funded because this study section is very, very rigorous and really, really difficult. Is the score good enough? Your grant proposal, I rejected. Melissa like cats. Yes, I don't know how many cats in the home, so it's cat stuff. You didn't receive funding. Okay, so yes, use this line. It's not about you. It's not you, it's me. 
but actually it's you. <laughs> it's really you. No, actually, I don't, it's, it's not personal, okay? Because they don't know who you are. Sometimes we do, but most of the times we don't. Uh, we just want to be um, collaborative. We want to be helpful. We, I want to be sure that all the reviewers of PSF understand that you have a very important role to guide the future of our specialty, which means that it's very important when you take a role as a reviewer that you write critiques that are constructive, useful, so that young people can continue to improve. And maybe you encourage them to submit for next year because all statistics have shown that a grants in the cusp of getting funded and take the reviews by heart can come back with a fundable grant the next year. Okay? So take the reviewers by heart. Uh, rejection is common. You get rejected all the time. And uh, even your best work I rejected. So, you know, step back, look at it, and come back again and compete. So if your grant was not reviewed, would not review, consider if it's the flaws in your research plan, with the errors in your grants, I mean, what is going on? Why are, understand what that happened. If your grant was reviewed and carefully read the review, take them comment carefully. And then many, many times, respond. Come back again the next round because in PSF and NIH, they allow you to resubmit, which means that they want to interact. They want you to do your grants and um, do your project better. So how do you revise? Okay, another thing that I teach all people, do not, and, and remember this, and I guess because it's a national forum, I'm gonna tell you, even with, with PRS and many of the grants, many of the papers review, when you respond to reviewers, and we wrote a paper about how to, in the PRS, about how to revise papers. I did not write a paper about how to revise grants. However, never use the word respectfully disagree, okay? I don't care how respectful you are. When you disagree, the reviewers hate you, okay? So they're trying to be helpful. So don't say respectfully disagree. I see that regularly, and I see some tones that, um, that doesn't show much respect because you're upset. Okay, cut it out, okay? Because ultimately, you want to get your paper accepted, you want to get funding, right? Be constructive. But also, don't be so acquiescent and kind of say, you are absolutely right, we appreciate this, oh, we love you, I mean, don't, don't say those things. Just be clear, okay? Answer the questions, okay? Be clear, be respectful, answer the questions, and keep moving, all right? So take off the emotional overtone. Um, the NIH has many uh, new rules now, at one time, you can only have one submission. In the old days, you can have two submissions. Now, one submission, then go back to two submissions. I haven't figured it out yet, but hopefully, I would not need two submissions. So hopefully, the one submission should be just enough. Okay, to revise, not revise. If your work is, so once you do that, and you think that I can answer these questions, because you can get a tone from the reviewers whether you can revise. So once you have that um, blessing to revise in some way, then revise. But if the tone is so negative, you may want to consider you know, send it somewhere else, or maybe revise the entire grant itself. So, anyway, uh, part of my life, I like to read, you guys, do you guys know this? I like to read guidebooks on travel, just because you get to see people's experiences without being there, and save time. Save time is very, <laughs> very helpful. These travels are painful. I just die on the plane. Sick on the plane. So you read, you see these travel guides, you know, and you watch these travel shows. You don't have to be there. It's, it's outstanding. So it's my advice to you is that if you have an urge to travel around the world, get one of the guidebooks. Just read. It's good enough. But I write guidebooks on my spare time. Guidebooks for PSF, for uh, hand surgery, about how to write paper, how to write grants. So if you want more information, I think this one is fundamental principles of writing a successful grant proposal. Um, so you can. We didn't, this presentation is original. This is a new presentation just for PSF or for you, but there may be much more details in this guidebook. So, thank you for your indulgence. It's been close to an hour and a half. So I'm going to end with a few take home points. Impactful project. Okay, pass out to each other. Understand whether your project is impactful that you believe in. Read the instructions. Give yourself plenty of time to writing. It has to be a pleasure to write the grant and not a onerous task. Read the instructions <laughs> again. Okay, so you are, you are not your grant. I mean, your grant project yourself, but so just because you're rejected doesn't mean that somebody just doesn't think that you are worth it because this is a very, very high level competition. It's much more than writing a paper. 
much higher competition because why is that? Money is involved. You're asking for people money. So you're going to get rejections. However, keep trying and eventually you will be your win and you'll be successful. And from PSS standpoint, we want everyone to win. We are, our main focus is to make sure that we mentor our young people and our junior investigators, even some of our senior investigators, so that they can be competitive to go to the next level. So everything we do, everything we do is to be sure that we elevate the entire specialty. And we cannot just have a grant that just go to the superficial surface of our study questions. We need to be able to leverage that and compete nationally. There's $31 billion out there for the NIH and many foundations. And people say, oh, the funding line is so tight, you know, why bother? Well, if you don't even try, you're not going to get it. And somebody's getting that $31 billion. And we are not in a position in plastic surgery to even compete for some of them. And many of the, you know, our young investigators are starting to compete and actually winning, which means that my message is that let's compete. We are the so-called toughest specialty to get in, and we have the best people in our specialty, why not compete at the highest level, which is the Department of Defense, which is the VA, which is the NIH, and then even the Gates Melinda, the Melinda Gates Foundation. Let's go for that, and we'll help from the Plastic Surgery Foundation standpoint. Perseverance is a good attribute. You got to persevere, because it's a long range thing. And I'm gonna say it again. We're gonna win the national championship. <laughs> I will say that next year. I will keep saying it until we actually do that. Thank you very much.